Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge & Company. CUNY's Institute of State and Local Governance is a unique addition to the CUNY system. The Institute's Executive Director and Professor of Sociology at the CUNY Graduate School, Michael Jacobson, combines his scholarly work with his much admired experience as a public servant, and he's my guest today. So welcome. Thanks for having me. Now, how, what have you created? <laughs> this, um, this wonderful kind of self-sustaining organization. Yeah, so I have a long history in government, and I've always been interested in state and local government. I've spent most of my life doing that, and so when Mark Shaw... Who, what, let me just interrupt. Yeah, yeah. Was that being a sociologist, a PhD in sociology, was that a sort of turn in your career to go into government? Uh, yeah, I mean, when I got my PhD, I just assumed I'd be a professor, because why else do you get a PhD? Yeah. And then I found myself being an intern to Herb <laughs> Sturz when oh. he was a deputy mayor for criminal justice, and somehow I planned to do that for three months, and I did it for 26 years. Um, so <laughs> now I'm circled back to academia, where I thought I'd start. Um, and so because I spent so long in local government, I've always been interested both practically and theoretically in state and local governments generally. That's where most government is. That's where peer, most people experience government. Mm -hmm. So the institute we created uh, works with government. That's what we do. We work with governments around the country, including New York City, on a variety of issues, governments that are interested in reforming <clears throat> um, their criminal justice systems or are interested in looking at agency efficiencies or how they spend money or what their budgets look like and how it should be structured, we do all that kind so of thing. So you're work. retained as a consultant to these different Correct. Localities. So that's right. Either, either governments themselves will hire us um, to help them in one of these areas or yeah. we'll You'll be funded develop by an it. idea. Right. We'll, <laughs> either, well, we'll develop an idea. Um, and approach governments, or sometimes mm -hmm. governments will approach us, or we'll work with a foundation like the MacArthur Foundation that was interested in reducing jail populations in 20 cities. Uh, so we are the intermediary for that big so program. Yeah. So you were, you got the sociology degree, then you went to work for Herb at the beginning of the Vera Institute, right. and then you went to the budget, right. OMB, Correct. and you handle criminal justice? I did. So when I was, I spent almost 10 years at OMB, the City Office of Management right. and Budget, and I oversaw the criminal justice system. And then you became commissioners. Right. So <laughs> I, when I, was a, I was a deputy budget director at OMB, and then I left there to become the commissioner of the Department of Probation. Which you wrote in your book <laughs> that you went to the department and then you wanted these programs, and they said, fine, but you cut them. Yes, they tortured me <laughs> for years. I would ask, how come the furniture is so bad? And they'd say, well, because you cut our furniture budget. Can't we? Get, can't we at least paint this place? Well, no, because we have no paint, because you <laughs> cut it. I don't know what I did in my life to deserve that, but yes, that's... And then you went to corrections. And then I went to corrections. So you were responsible for Rikers. I was. Uh, and was it a mess then? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's... It's always it's, been a mess. It's, it, you know, it's always been a mess. I mean, it grew, you know, it, it, it skyrocketed from, you know, four or 5,000 beds to... It peaked under David Dinkins at about 22,000, and it's been slowly decreasing. But it grew so fast um, that it, you know, uh, we just tried to make the best of it we could. When I actually, the, the day I was appointed to be the correction commissioner, I believe that same day the cover story of New York Magazine was Rikers ready to blow. And I remember my much. mother calling me, saying, what are you doing? <laughs> mother, so. We always had mothers, right? <laughs> exactly. So yeah, it's always, it's always had issues. <laughs> do you, now that you're back at the, insti you're at the Institute, you do things like equity indicators. What does right. that mean? Well, so we, <clears throat> when we first started, we started talking to the Rockefeller Foundation and to the then new uh, mayor's office, Mayor de Blasio about, because obviously he was interested and ran on the issue of uh, equality, and we are very interested in, in measuring uh, sort of social and economic uh, factors over time. So we proposed to the city and to the Rockefeller Foundation that we could, at a very granular level, start measuring over time inequality in New York City. And, you know, when most people think about inequality, they think of inequality in income and wage mm -hmm. terms, which is obvious That's and incredibly major important. major thing we talk about. We think of it certainly in those terms, but also what does inequality look like 
in other sectors of life and government? What does inequality mean in the justice system? What does inequality mean in higher education? What does inequality mean in transportation? And sometimes that is related to money. Sometimes, as in transportation, the biggest inequalities in New York City are between people who are disabled and the able-bodied. It's not about money. Mm. If you're disabled, you mm. are the most unequal, the most disadvantaged group. You can have a lot of money, but if you're in a wheelchair, it's, you can't, you it's can't right. And so, um, so we're very interested in looking at those kinds, really very specific uh, indicators of inequality, and we measure them over time to see whether they're getting better or worse. We've done that in New York City now for two years, and we're about to expand that work to five. Doing it K through 12 also. Uh, we look at K through 12. We look at housing, the housing, the justice system, Every city services, property uh, taxes. <clears throat> um, we Are look you at do property taxes. Well, we you know that we, we <laughs> actually want to do a project separate and apart on property you taxes should. because in nobody New York City, does and people as, don't understand it right no it's very complicated but also very meaningful it's um, extremely meaningful correct. and it's getting more and more so I think yeah as and they, that, oh, what? well I was just gonna say on that equality work that I was just describing that we mm -hmm. do in New York City we're about to expand to five other cities oh, nationally because uh, equality is it's a thing now at, yeah. uh, for a, a variety of reasons at the local yeah. level. The, the new administration, uh, the new federal administration actually is raising those issues. Uh, more and more. more Causing them. Well, exactly. Causing more. And so, right. so in a lot of ways, we think, you know, the action to the extent there's going to be sort of reform and progressive stuff going on in government <clears throat> is going to be at the state and local yeah. level. Do you think that's going to continue with the uh, criminal justice? I'm Jumping ahead. Mm -hmm. No, sure. But uh, uh, you wrote a book about downsizing. Mm -hmm. And how long ago? Ten years ago? Uh, give or take, yeah. So that was at an era when everybody with, you know, three strikes here out and all the kind of put them in prison and everything. Right. That's why Dinkins had the high census. Right. Uh, has it, it's changed. It has changed. It's so what's lower. Yeah. So what's happened in the last decade, put aside the current federal administration, right. Right. Um, is that... You know, we've incarcerated so many people, mass incarceration is what criminologists uh, like to call it, um, that even conservatives now have sort of come to the table, not just about because it costs too much money. It's not all the research will show. It's not particularly effective. Our recidivism mm -hmm. rates are incredibly high. Right. We're just spending tons of money that states and cities don't really have uh, to do something that's not particularly effective. So you have this... Uh, collection of unusual suspects, whether it's uh, you know Newt Gingrich and the Koch brothers and George Soros and uh, the former President Obama, you know all can agree. It's the only issue I know of actually where there is that is kind of them. agreement that we have too many people in prison. It's not working. It's inefficient. It takes money away from other essential areas of government, and because of that interesting kind of coalition. There's been a lot of activity at the state and local levels in the recent in recent years. States have decided to downsize their prison systems. New York's prison system is the fastest shrinking prison system in the country. The Rikers population, as we just talked about, has been cut in half. So there are interesting things going on around the country. And the, one of the outstanding questions is what impact um, will uh, President Trump and Attorney General Sessions have on this? At the moment, that's still continuing, and there was a front-page article just the other day in the Times about despite the conservative mm -hmm. rhetoric at the federal level, states are still trying mm -hmm. to lower their prison So it, the effect would be seen in the federal, federal system? You'll certainly see it in the federal yeah. system, but, you know, the federal, the federal government can have impacts on the Is there a reflection of conservative governors uh, like Arkansas? Do you know, is their prison population down? I'm not sure about Arkansas, but I can tell you that most states, whether mm -hmm. uh, R's or D's, conservatives or progressives, <clears throat> most states are now, Texas is one, for example, Louisiana, um, are trying to lower their prison populations. It just, it costs, all these states are cash strapped. It costs yeah. incredible amounts of money. Um, you know, the disproportionate incarceration of people of color is a huge issue, not just for progressives, but now for conservatives as well. Um, so there's, there's not a state that I know of. There are some states that are still increasing, but there's not a state that I know of where this isn't an issue within the state. And it has, 
thankfully, in the last 10 years, essentially transcended the usual yeah, political so dynamic. Did I see a figure that a yearly cost is $300-some-odd thousand? Well, in, so in New York City, um, the, it's, New York City has the most expensive, as far as I know, uh, system in the country, a, a, a jail bed on Rikers or in one of the borough houses when you load it up with pensions and fringe benefits costs around a quarter of a million dollars a year. It's incredibly it's expensive. Incredible. Most prison systems, the New York state prison system is around six, uh, 60, about 60, 60,000. Some, you know, like the ones in the South, uh, um, 30. Uh, yeah, 30 or even or less. even less. And the thing about prison is, put the Rikers aside, you know, in some ways prison should be expensive. It's, uh, you know, you have people captive, you have to provide everything they need, it's both security, food, programs, heat, light, power, electricity. The thing is you should use it very parsimoniously yeah. um, and constructively. Yeah. And we, we, the United States, have just defaulted to putting people in prison. And when you do that, you get what we Does got. the cost differ uh, in, in part because of the unions and the different... Uh, yeah, costs? I mean, unions... Um, you know, it's such a complicated field because you have unions, you have private prisons, you know, and they, I mean, they're very different. They, they, they uh, are... Um, Parsimonious. Uh, yeah, well, and they, you know, they're, the they're sort of political yeah. enemies in every way, although they have some of the same incentives, yeah. right? More money. Yeah. Um, so it is a very difficult job being a correctional officer. I don't have any problem at all with people who do that job if they do it well. Uh, getting paid a decent amount. The, the problem is we have 1.4, 1.5 million people in prison, not including jail, and the number should be less than half of that. That's why we spend so much money. It's not that we should pay correctional officers 50000 instead of 70000 mm. They have very hard jobs. Mm -hmm. It's that we have way, way too many people in prison. And then you also face the local opposition of eliminating a prison site because it becomes such an enormous economic benefit to a community, right? Yeah, so the politics around this are so <laughs> interesting. And, you know, people usually think of these kind of politics as Republican versus Democratic politics. But in almost every state, the downsizing prisons dynamic is less about Republicans versus Democrats than upstate, downstate. Um, because most prisons in most states are not in cities. City. They're in upstate communities, and frequently they're seen as a boon to economic development, yeah. especially in depressed communities. Right. And they hold on to them, or, and they fight for them in yeah. the same way that cities can fight for the Olympics. So how did the Rikers report, the commission? Right. How did it address all these issues? Well, it was, uh, it so well? This was a commission uh, that was <laughs> chaired by Judge Littman, mm -hmm. the former uh, chief judge of New York State. There were 27 commissioners, I believe, from various backgrounds, criminal justice experts, formerly incarcerated folks, business people, mm -hmm. developers, judges. Um, so it was a very diverse and every level commission. And, uh, we, you know, we had a very sort of disciplined process, which was both um, a lot of education up front, because uh, although some of us have experience lived... Experience was uneven. Yeah, right? lived these issues for years. Others uh, came to it pretty fresh. And so, um, and what was interesting to see, not particularly surprising in some ways, is the more people understood both what jails do, what the experience of Rikers is, what you, what you could imagine a better system being, the commission quickly coalesced around the notion that, you know, Rikers, which I agree with, Rikers, you know, it's, it's not that there have always been problems on Rikers, which is true, is that in some fundamental way, Rikers itself is the problem. It's the problem. Um, and no matter how much money you pour into it, you can make it better than it is. <laughs> but in the end, it's always going to be an out of sight, out of mind place, transportation hugely difficult, Locations. crumbling infrastructure. Yeah. Getting people to court by nine in the morning means waking them up at three in the morning. I mean, it's just, you could never overcome that. And since most people in Rikers are pretrial detainees, they're not guilty of anything. The reason they're there is because they can't afford bail, most of which is pretty low bail. And so it is, it's an essential part of government. Uh, people who aren't guilty, we thought, as do most experts, should be in the boroughs. Who aren't from. judged guilty. Correct. They're not yeah. judged guilty right. yet. They may be at the end of the right. process. They may not be. But right now, mm -hmm. they're just charged with a crime. In the United States, you're not guilty until you are, are found guilty. 
Um, and for folks who have to be in jail, and we argue not all of them do have to be in jail, but for folks that have to be in jail, they should be near their families. They should be able to have visits from their families, from their attorneys. It's incredibly important, not just for sort of human and moral and dignity issues, but all of the research has shown the more you have those connections, the better off you'll be. And that's why the commission came pretty rapidly to the conclusion that Rikers had to be closed, and then it was a matter of how do you do that, um, and then what do you do in its place in the boroughs. Uh, so it was an interesting process. It was a pretty fast process. Yeah. It was around right. a year, and the report we released um, a month or so ago, I think is, a, is for one of these commissions, a, mm -hmm. a pretty good, certain powerful piece of work. And as you know, the, both the mayor and the governor now both agree. Uh, so when, when does the timetable start? Well, it's, so you know what I liked about the report is it's basically common sense. Right. It just makes such common sense. Right. And we recognize, you know, this is we're not this, for none of us on the commission. This is not our first rodeo. We understand that there are huge politics involved in doing this. But I think one of the things we tried to show is that if you do shrink the population that's in jail, if you do move um, all the jails or some jails now in the boroughs to the boroughs, you'll not only have a better, more humane, more efficient criminal justice system, you'll also save hundreds of millions of dollars um, over the long term. So it works fiscally uh, and it works from a justice perspective. And from and, out and, and good sense. I mean, right. you know, we just have this prison system where you just you take people in and once they're in, chances are they'll be back in, I think, no? Yeah, no, the recidivism rates yeah. are incredibly high. So, and I mean, and we being need in jail, to stop it. right, being in jail as a detainee mm -hmm. increases your chance of going to prison just because you're in. Yeah. And the thing about jail and being a pretrial detainee is the only reason anyone should ever be in jail as a pretrial detainee is because there's a high risk that they'll flee or a high risk that they'll hurt somebody. If neither of those are the case, you should not be in jail pretrial. You should be out in the community, being supervised, or just coming back to your court dates. You know, over half the people who are arrested right now in New York City are released on their own recognizance, and they come back to court. Mm -hmm. to their appearance is just like you and I mm -hmm. would. And so you want to maximize that because you, for all the obvious reasons, you don't want to take people out of their communities and families and put them in jail if you don't have to, it would deprive them of their liberty. But again, all the research will show that if you overpunish, if you punish people who are sort of low risk, low level uh, folks, you will turn them into high risk, high level mm -hmm. folks, which is why, because going back to the $250,000 per year number, you want to use that resource as parsimoniously and as carefully as you can. Um, and that's the, what the, co the, the, the commission sort of coalesced around. Do it in the boroughs, build better, more humane, more efficient. And when I say more humane, I mean more humane both for the inmates and for the staff. You know, the correction officers, I was the commissioner for uh, over three years. I don't think any correction officer in New York City wakes up and says, I can't wait to go to AMKC, uh, you know, on Rikers <laughs> yeah. Island today, which is one of the yeah. bigger, older jails there. You know, no one wants to. And it takes be, them even. It there. takes them a long time. No, it's, so they don't it's even just have place. it's yeah. it's a horrible it's commute. A mess. It's you know, if if I argue, and I think we argued, if you're a correction officer, uh, which is already a high stress, difficult job, and you live in Brooklyn, wouldn't you rather work in a facility in Brooklyn? That's a new sort of, you know, light, good acoustics, mm -hmm. humane programmed facility with, you know, better trained officers, less violence. I argue that you would much rather do that than go out to Rikers. So to implement this report, it doesn't have to be done one thing at a time. I mean, we know it's going to take time to design and site facilities. Mm -hmm. Right. We know it's going to take some time to change the bail system. Right. To change all these things, what's the what's the uh, 
when is it going to start? <laughs> well, you, think, uh, you know, I mean, um, it should be starting now. Uh, correct. And so the mayor what do we have to do. And I'm assuming the mayor is starting now. So if you look at the, the executive budget that the mayor just mm -hmm. released a couple of weeks ago, I think there's a I want to say a, a billion dollars in there for new jail facilities of some kind. Now it's going to cost a lot more initially than a billion dollars. We actually estimate the cost, the cash costs up front to build these places will cost $11 billion. Um, although, as I said, you will actually save money. Will they the do it with run. bonds? Can we, yeah. It's going to be so, a yes, correct. So the, the, way, the way, I won't, I won't bore you or your uh, viewers with too much financial detail, but when you, the way the city funds things like this is if you have an $11 billion capital program, they bond it out just mm -hmm. like you would get a mortgage when mm -hmm. you uh, buy an apartment. Um, that would cost around eight to $900 million a year to build something that's $11 billion. But you save, when you start to shrink the population and move to the boroughs, mm -hmm. you save about $1.5 billion a year. So this actually saves money over time, though you have to spend the money now to build these. So in answer to your question, what the mayor needs to start doing is not just sort of finding the money, but starting the land use process, Absolutely. starting the design process, right. starting some of the projects that he's already been starting and Liz Glazer, who's the head of the mayor's office of criminal justice, has been working on for a while, but expand programs that will shrink the population. So as you say, this is not, this is not a linear thing. You don't do this first, then this, then this. You have to start doing all of this simultaneously and then phase this in over time. It's complicated. It's not impossible. Um, and I think it's a great project. And the other thing which we haven't talked about is what you get when all this is done is not just financial savings, not just a better justice system, but you free up this 420 acre parcel of land for the city to reuse that the city will never have again. I mean, even for New York City, 420 mm -hmm. acres is a mammoth piece of land. So it's a huge urban planning development mm -hmm. Uh, Should be exciting. Possibility. It's hugely exciting. Talk about industrial parks or whatever. Or the expansion, the the expansion turning LaGuardia into yeah. a major yeah. uh, international airport yeah, with longer true. runways. Right. So that was the door. commission's yeah. recommendation. Uh -huh. um, so great. Yes. Yeah. So let's just, I know it's elementary, but jails are for people who are sentenced to less than a year sentence. They're for people who are Indicted or not? Can you have people who are not indicted there? Yeah, I so, so yeah. 75 to 80 percent of everyone who's in the city jail mm -hmm. system, and this is true around the country, are pretrial detainees. Pre -trial. There, some of them may be indicted, but none of them, none of those 80 mm -hmm. percent have been found guilty of anything. Right. You have another 20 percent that have actually been sentenced, and as you say, waiting. if you're sentenced to less than a year mm -hmm. of time, you mm -hmm. serve it in a jail. If you're sentenced in New York State, let's say to three to five years mm -hmm. for an armed robbery, then you're you up. go to state prison. So right. the jail system is full, mostly of people who are not guilty but are in the process of their criminal case, or they have been found guilty of usually relatively minor crimes and are serving less than a year. And parole violators? Parole what violators. Are they? Is that a failure of the Department of Probation? Well, so there's <laughs> parole and and probation, let's talk about parole first. So parole exists, anyone that leaves state prison, um, unless you max out of your sentence, you serve every day of your sentence, mm -hmm. which is very rare. Most people leave prison with some time still remaining on your sentence. You are under the supervision of the New York State Department of mm -hmm. Parole. Um, and they have a series of conditions See, you have to, thing, you have to, right, you have to meet, you have to be looking or have a job, you have to have a stable address, you have to be drug free. If you violate any one or more of those conditions, you are subject of, of that parole officer filing a violation which can send you back to prison. But their first stop before they do that is you're held on Rikers. So those people are on Rikers too. One of the good things, and we should tell this to people, is the recommendations for the new prisons be, is that they're on public land right. and that they're adjacent or near the court system so it's all coordinated. Correct. So people shouldn't worry that the jail is going to be next to their home. Right. Well, we, what our recommendation are, uh, is, is that there are three jails right now in the boroughs. There's the Brooklyn House mm -hmm. in downtown Brooklyn. Um, there's the Tombs, the Manhattan uh, Jail, which is uh, um, in 
Tribeca uh, <laughs> adjacent to Chinatown. And then there's the Queens Jail, which is uh, uh, vacant at the moment. They are all next, they all exist now. They're all next to courts. Um, what our recommendation is, is those, all those buildings be torn down um, and replaced with more modern uh, uh, facilities. And for us, when you, when you look at a place like the Brooklyn House, for people who live in Brooklyn or even drive up Atlantic Avenue, you see yeah, it. Right it is one of the ugliest. It is a right pan there. to early yeah. Stalinist architecture, right? I mean, it's a horrible looking building. And because of its poor design, there are Department of Correction vans, triple parked on the sidewalk. It, it's a mess. And even with that, that neighborhood has developed exponentially over the last yeah. 20 years. But, you, you know, but what people have to think about is the kind of facilities we're talking about will never look like that. Let no one will ever build a jail that looks like that. It looks now. like a jail. But correct. I mean, yeah. when you look at the most yeah. modern facilities that are being built now around the country in San Diego or in Denver, when you look at them, you wouldn't know. Is that mm. a jail or is that a condo? Mm. You know, there's commercial space on the bottom. There are nice civic looking buildings. All the transportation is inside. So. I would argue it's actually an improvement yeah. <clears throat> to replace. I hate to jails. tell you this, but we are at the end of this program, and we haven't even discussed. And I wanted to uh, the examples that people have seen in Germany and everything, and how it, and the training and all of that. But I know you're going to be able to continue these discussions, right? I, because you're yeah. going to have a new program. We are. We're going to have a, <laughs> a, a monthly show on CUNY TV uh, called The Wonk, uh, <laughs> where we'll talk about this and, and, other, and things. other things. Well, I'm going to watch to see if you talk about these newer facilities. So thank you so much, well, Michael for Jacobson. Me. Thank you. We at CUNY TV always like to hear from our viewers. So if you have any subjects you'd like to explore or people you'd like to hear, please let us know. Write to us at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or go to our website, cuny.tv, and click on Contact Us. We look forward to hearing from you.